Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our event today. My name is Prijesh. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at EOS Data Analytics. I'll be your host and speaker for today's webinar on the topic, Agritech Solutions for the North American Market. I'm also accompanied by Kate. She's joining us from the chat section as a moderator. Uh, you'll find the chat section at the bottom right corner of your screen. And before I proceed, I would like to know from you if you can see me and hear me well. Please let me know with a yes or no in the chat section. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. All right. So during the webinar, I'm sure you'll have some specific questions. Uh, so please feel free to write them in the chat section. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So we'll select some uh, some good and interesting questions from you, and uh, we'll answer them uh, in detail. So I will start with a slide uh, on the agenda for today's webinar. So I'll quickly go through this agenda of today's webinar. So we'll have a clear understanding of the presentation and a good webinar experience. I will start with the, first of all, I'll start with a brief intro on EOS data analytics, like who we are, when did we start our journey and the strategic direction that we are heading to, followed by the outline of our products uh, and solutions for the agriculture industry, I would also like to share our review on the agro market in the US and Canada. I'll talk about the opportunities for satellite database solutions and the challenges, then a rundown on the satellite technology and data on how they are effective on solving the existing issues in uh, agriculture industry. This will also be a curtain raiser to the main topic in our agenda today of custom solutions, uh, which are developed by our own R&D department uh, our R&D department consists of scientists and engineers who are specialized in using satellite imagery analysis and advanced technologies like machine learning techniques, uh, AI modeling, and big data analysis to develop interesting and unique solutions for the agriculture industry. And finally, I would also like to speak about our upcoming satellite constellation project, EOSAT, followed by the QA session, QA session, which will be for about 10 to 20 minutes. And during that period, we will pick out the most interesting questions from you and try to answer them. So EOS Data Analytics, we are a privately held company with headquarters at Menlo Park in California. Our main products are web-based platforms uh, used based on satellite data. At present, we have more than 200 employees located in the US and different locations in Eastern Europe. Our research and development efforts are backed by a group of 15 scientists who lead the R&D department. The knowledge base and the techniques developed by them are used for providing solutions for various industry verticals. Our core expertise is in agriculture and forestry. This enables us to partner with different, uh, I would say different business entities and government institutions and even scientific organizations and meet their business educational and research needs. This time series diagram perfectly explains our journey. So you can see that we, our company was founded in 2014 uh, by Max Polyakov, who is an international entrepreneur and investor known for de developing successful businesses around space technology and IT. Initially, we started with development of platforms which today form the supporting system of our current products. Uh, one of them, for example, EOS Storage, uh, it provided cloud infrastructure for storing and obtaining uh, instant access to thousands of terabytes of Earth observation or GIS data. Then in 2016, we came out with the LandViewer platform that provides on-the-fly satellite imagery processing, very useful for GIS researchers. Using the experience from our first commercial product launch, we confidently launched the Crop Monitoring Platform, which is a comprehensive farm management solution available as a web-based platform. Then in 2018, our R&D team got a breakthrough that enabled us to de develop unique uh, deep learning models, or I would say machine learning models, which would be used in classifying fields and its boundaries according to the crop type, uh, clusterize uh, fields based on a date, particular data set, 
mask irrelevant objects on a satellite images. Uh, and for further development of custom solutions like soil moisture data analytics and crop yield forecast. This November, uh, we are looking forward to the launch of our own satellite constellation. Uh, that's our strategic direction until to 2025 to uh, achieve a complete control over the satellite data production and enhance the data quality provided through our products and solutions. With the launch, with the first launch set to be in November, we'll also become the first company to launch a satellite constellation fully focused on agricultural needs. A quick overview through our product offerings, uh, the solutions and the services that we offer to the customers in agricultural industry. So our product offerings include uh, the crop monitoring platform. And to start using it, you need to have a subscription purchased. The data available over the platform can also be extracted through API route. Uh, the platform uses satellite data to provide various agro data analytics that helps its users to detect crop health and governing factors that affect farm production cycle. Therefore, it, it helps in increasing crop yield and also reducing input costs. The platform also provides other tools to track weather, optimize nutrient application, and enhance farm operations with features that save operational time and resources. And one more additional information is that the platform can also be customized as a white label product with your preferred color, company logo, uh, domain name, and standard features to give it your business identity. At the moment, crop monitoring platform is used by around more than 735,000 growers and farmers in 195 countries. That's about 21 million hectares of farmlands covered through this platform, meaning that's the amount of area that is processed or analyzed using the help, with the help of crop monitoring platform. And also, as I mentioned, we have also our cap we have the capability to develop and provide custom solutions. That is what we are going to focus on in today's uh, webinar. So we have successfully delivered uh, projects based on custom solutions uh, to some of the customers, as you can see here at the bottom, to the World Bank, Bayer, and even like food production or sugar processing companies like Ryzen. Now, I would like to give you a quick rundown on our understanding and our observations on the US and Can Canadian market, the agricultural market in North America. We have been seeing an upward, upward uh, trend in the US and Canada uh, when it comes to accepting innovative technologies, whether it be in farm equipment, uh, crop protection chemicals, and even farm management practices. One of the positive effects has been an increase in the establishment of agricultural cooperatives who, who, that are appreciating the use of precision agriculture technologies and computer data to increase their output and provide more profits to their members. Even food production companies are embracing the use of technology to let go of traditional farm practices and introduce a system of food traceability. These developments are creating a bigger demand uh, among the agricultural enthusiasts to understand the agricultural land use and the related data to implement better strategies to increase the farm productivity. Although these market observations uh, imply the increase in data analytics, the usage of data analytics, but it goes without the saying that the biggest challenge is still having an expertise and understanding of data analysis, which I personally believe is at the core of the digital transformation process. We work around satellite technology and we understand the, the very benefits the Earth observation data brings to our customers. Farmers, food producers, and even governments and agricultural policy makers gain a lot of insights to help them make better decisions. So satellite data analytics is now the prefer also the preferred solution for tackling issues of climate change and food security in the shortest possible time. With the analysis of satellite imagery, we are able to provide valuable information on crop development, land use, crop rotation practices, uh, possibilities of drought, soil moisture, and even soil degradation. At a larger scale, satellite data helps in predicting a region's agricultural output, improves supply chain planning, and also mitigates food shortage crisis and food wastage. Now I will dive into our custom solutions uh, on how these solutions are processed, 
what kind of techniques we use to uh, generate an output. I will start with the crop classification solution. Crop classification is also known as land cover classification or land use mapping and even crop type mapping. So it involves classifying the land surface according to the type of uh, the crop growing there with multi-temporal satellite imagery and deployment of machine learning uh, approaches. Uh, that is a neural network scheme. We also call them as neural network schemes sometimes. We are able to process the data analysis based on space and time series analysis. So here we use, uh, in our methodology, we use the convolutional LSTM model, which, is, which stands for long short-term memory model as our preferred machine learning model. So this model, what it does is that it extracts the spatial features and then the temporal features for our crop classification process, the output that we intend to get from it. To make it easier for our customers, uh, to make it easier for them to understand, we have defined the step-by-step step, step, step by step, uh, procedure that is implemented to get a crop classification output. So it begins with a collection of ground truth data, which is mostly provided by the customer. And we use it for further processing of the data and for analysis and for uh, checking the availability of any duplicates or like irrelevant, irrelevant data, which, which we should not go into the processing, further processing. So ground truth data, in other words, we can, I can also say that it is the data collected from direct observation and measurement from the farmlands, the farmlands which needs to be classified in which we have to identify the crops growing there. So to ensure a better training of our neural network model, our machine learning model, the ground truth data must be at least three to 5% of the total area where classification is required. That data, so form of data set also helps us to understand uh, the crop calendar, like the basic information about that particular crop and the fields like sowing date and harvesting state, uh, date from the either from the expected ones from the current season or from the previous seasons. So this is an example of a typical ground truth data, an excerpt from a ground truth data. Uh, this is from coming from a project on which uh, we worked with a, uh, with Ryzen in India. They are, as they are known for sugar processing capabilities. Uh, they are known as a sugar processing company, the third largest in Brazil. They also have uh, rights over certain farmlands in central part of India. So this is an example of a ground truthing data that we were able to get from them, which we used for classification of sugarcane fields in India. So further, this data was used for identification and classification of those farms using our classification techniques, which I'm going to elaborate in the upcoming slides. So before we, I describe the techniques that we use for crop classification, uh, I would also like to tell you that each of our custom solutions, we also require certain like input data from the client side or from the customer side. So when it comes to crop classification, we the main input data that we require is the ground truthing data. So and along with that, we also need a sample of the AOI file, the area of interest file, which, uh, which contains the geometry of the field, some sample fields from the region of your interest, where you need the crop classification or the crop type mapping to happen, uh, to be done. So the acceptable, acceptable format of the AOI file is mostly shape file or a KML file or a GeoJSON file. This data is very important for us to analyze the extent of image coverage uh, check the internal processing costs and also quality of the final result. Then further, we also try to understand uh, the other characteristics provided within the ground truth data, like the number of points or the number of field points that you are providing to us in the ground truth data, in the, uh, the ground truth data collection. Uh, that sort of information helps us to understand whether you have really provided as the 3%, the information on 3% of the total area or not. And we also try, get, try to get more information. We, we are able to get more information about what is the average size of farms or how is the distribution of farms in that area, whether it's a uniform distribution or scattered distribution of farms. And we are also able to understand whether there is a balance between the different data sets that you have provided to us, if there is any possibility or 
chances of error in the data. So we are able to uh, verify all this information. Uh, this is also an, a vital step that we do while we are processing the ground truthing data from you. Uh, the next step is uh, the yeah this this slide was supposed to be the explanation of that step in which we assess the quality of the ground data in which we uh, determine or find out what is the distribution of the farms in the ground data that you have provided the number of field points that are available in the ground truth data those kind of inputs we pre-process or we do a pre-qualification of that data as a as a second step the third step involves the preparation of data sets so here we have uh, three steps. That is, first is data upload, uh, second is data cleaning, and the third one is data optimization. So it starts with data upload to our, like the data that we have received from you, the ground truth data, we upload it to our AI model, uh, to, the, to the neural network model, the neural network scheme model by, by certain processes, like by searching, filtering, and receiving data from external sources. External sources meaning the sources, uh, your like the data that we have received from you, and afterwards, the data cleaning and data optimization is done. So, the basic difference between the two is that data cleaning is done to remove any data that may affect the quality of output. So, there is always a possibility of some duplicates or dummy values or even incorrect data formats in the ground truth data. So, we uh, we avoid those uh, the risks that may happen in the in the quality of the output by, by the, the process of data cleaning. After data cleaning, uh, if there is any, if let's say there was a heavy removal of corrupted data in the data cleaning step, it may affect the, it may also affect the accuracy of the output. So in order to uh, eliminate the risks of, you know, decreasing of the accuracy of the output, we carry out a third step of data optimization. So this step is basically done to adapt the leftover data for problem solving and increase the efficiency of the analysis as an additional step. The fourth step that we do within the crop classification is once we are through, uh, when once we are through with the preparation of data sets, we begin with data labeling and launch of the machine learning algorithms. So this is basically the process of identifying the farms. This is the process at which we start identifying the farms and start labeling them to make it recognizable for our machine learning model to learn further learn from it. So these are some sample screenshots from our data labeling process. As you can see, the fields uh, they have on the left side, so the, the, the photo on the left side shows uh, some certain labeling of the fields, identification of the fields and labeling of the fields. And on the right, the image on the right side shows further classification on the basis of some color coding we are further classifying uh, the type uh, the the crops the fields on the basis of the crop type the crops growing in those fields then afterwards as a fifth step we move on to the classification results for the for the area of interest we start getting results based on the total area of farms that have been classified, uh, total area of farms that are not labeled, and total area of farms classified according to the crop types. And the next steps are involved in uh, making the result detailed in terms of the level of classification. So as you can see that in this sample image that we are showing i'm showing to you it is it is actually coming from uh, a project related to world bank uh, it was a project for identifying all the fields and identifying the fields according to the crop type in the country of ukraine which is in eastern europe so this project the so the whole purpose of this project was to ensure find out whether there is any deviation in the land governance uh, in the agricultural land use uh, deviation in the land governance policies in the country so this particular example that you're looking at, this shows a field cl uh, crop classification done at a field level. You can notice that all the fields are classified and uh, identified according to the type of crops growing there. So this output of the crop classification can also be provided in a vector format, which can be further integrated to our one of the products that we have, that is crop monitoring platform, or it can also be provided to you in the form of a report uh, either as a PDF or a Word document. So as I mentioned that this example comes from one of our project from the world, with the World Bank. 
we had to classify all the farms according to the crop type. And this classification was done starting from the year 2016 until 2021. So we are also able to do a classification over multiple years. So even if it is for the current season or the previous seasons, we can also provide you the result uh, at different frequency for different years. Then, uh, yeah, this image further shows the additional information that we can retrieve from the crop class classification if it is done for multiple years. As you can notice in that highlighted section, we are also able to identify what was the what were what were the crop rotation practices being carried out like what what crops were being grown in a one single field over different years so this is also an additional value added information that we are able to get through crop classification if you have any questions related to the technique the methods that we use on our custom solutions feel please uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat section and uh, we'll pick out those questions at the end in the q a session and i will be happy to answer those now let's look at the key benefits uh, of crop classification like why why crop classification is recommended so we identify four major benefits of crop, uh, crop classification number one uh, it makes the availability of a proper inventory at regional level so this helps in assessing the vegetation condition and comparison of results over different years for a particular region or a particular crop type. Second, it also enables data transparency for the government and international development agencies like, for example, World Bank that I referred to. And uh, the projects related to those go different governments and international development agencies so that, they, uh, so that a claim from a farmer can be verified. It also helps in developing a database, including cadastral information, uh, declared or unregistered land or even registered land and field parcel measurement. And lastly, it also helps in understanding where and what crops are growing in a region. So this gives a vital information mainly to the commodity traders and even to governments to fix potential crops as, as the cash crops of the country, and also to set price points and even consider some ecological measures like uh, use of fertilizers. We also have some additional solutions that can be integrated with crop classification to make the final output look more like valuable and also more accurate. A couple of added solutions are field boundaries detection and uh, harvest status monitoring. Our field boundaries detection solution or the technology, it actually outlines all the fields in the selected area. So once we have done the crop classification, identify the fields and the crops growing in those fields. Uh, crop uh, field boundaries detection solution, the technology used behind the solution, it enables identifying the delineation of all the fields in the selected area. So this can be done for the current season and also for the previous seasons. And further, it allows this solution allows us to calculate the total acreage of the field. Like uh, we are also able to define what is the size of each field under the uh, within the crop classification solution. So to accomplish field boundaries uh, detection, we mostly use uh, Sentinel-2 images uh, to segment the fields uh, within a, with a machine learning approach. The selection criteria of images is typically from the middle stages of crop growing season when the fields are best identified as separate project, uh, objects. It is also possible to use higher resolution imagery to get more accuracy and uh, in cases when we have uh, to detect fields of sizes less than two to three hectares. And then here as well, we still require a sample AOI file in vector formats, uh, in shapefile or KML or GeoJSON file. If you have already provided us with a vector file uh, for the crop classification, then we can use the same sample file as well. So the output is the, the kind of output, the type output data type that we get from field boundaries detection is can also be in vector format. And uh, the, the level of accuracy that we are able to reach is up to 85%, 75 to 85%, which is really impressive. The main benefit of field boundaries detection is that you are able to, of course, first of all, you are able to detect the agricultural land detect the cultiva cultivated area 
uh, as well as align the contours of the farms to improve the accuracy of crop classification done on those farms. So these are the main benefits of doing a field boundaries detection. Uh, the second, uh, I would say, another uh, value-added custom solution that which we can also combine with crop classification is harvest status monitoring. So this is done to harvest status monitoring is basically done to detect the level of harvest of a farm at a given date or at a given period of its uh, of the crop growing season. For example, if you want to identify if your farm is completely harvested or partially harvested or not at all harvested. So you can basically understand those kind of insights through this solution. The input data that we require here are satellite images at a frequency of every five to 10 days at least. The satellite, uh, satellite data could be either optical data or radar based data. Then constant field monitoring by doing a time series analysis of any vegetation index, most pr preferably we use NDVI index, the time series analysis of NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index. A sharp, a sharp drop in the NDVI would generally indicate that it is uh, the crop is approaching a harvesting stage. So that's why we use the time series analysis of NDVI. And thirdly, an estimate of uh, harvest status index is done by a formula which is used to calculate the harvest stated in, in, uh, status index, which is the ratio between the harvested area and the total area of the field, giving us a metric to determine the, the level of the status of the harvest. So this slide describes the, the this process, the time series analysis of NDVI done on a like a temporal, uh, the, the temporal, the collection of temporal satellite images and the analysis of NDVI over a time series. And uh, we are able to detect the presence of uh, biomass with the help of time series analysis of NDVI and uh, determine uh, what is the amount of harvest or what is a biomass estimate and further calculate the harvest status uh, index. Next up, uh, it's yield prediction and modeling. It is also one of the request, the most requested custom solutions uh, that we are able to offer to our customers. So yield prediction is done to estimate the amount of crops that will be harvested and collected at the end of a season. So to calculate yield values, we use uh, use field level information that includes uh, crop calendar information like sowing date, harvesting dates from the previous seasons, crop variety, uh, soil profile data, and the prevailing weather conditions like temperature, precipitation, and so on, and for uh, and those kind of weather uh, weather parameters from that particular region where the yield value is to be estimated. These information, these uh, statistics, are further deployed with the use of multi-level machine learning algorithms to estimate the amount of yield. So we can estimate the yield uh, either at field level or, or at a regional level, it depends on your requirements. So if you want us to estimate the yield value for each individual field at a particular region or a zone, we can do that. Or if you want us to estimate the yield value coming from a one like a cluster of farmlands, a farmland in a region, we can also provide you the yield output for that at a regional level, at a larger level. The accuracy of our model, the model that we use to estimate yield is over 90%, which again, uh, which also depends on the timing of the yield calculation. So that is, if the yield estimate is calculated two weeks before the harvesting stage, then, the, then we are able to achieve a 90% accuracy. If the timing of the yield estimation is two months before harvest, then it, we are able to achieve an accuracy of up to 75 to 80%. In order to ensure uh, an accurate and efficiency in the accuracy and efficiency in the process, uh, we combine two types of yield prediction models. One is based on biophysical model, and the other one, other model is based on statistical data modeling. Biophysical model starts with data collection from the area of interest. Uh, those data are mostly weather parameters, uh, soil profile, phenological data. Further, uh, and a process called leaf area index assimilation is done uh, 
by with the help of remote sensed uh, remote sensing data like with the help of the satellite uh, imagery uh, to ensure accuracy in case the statistical data is missing or it is not if it is not available and further a simulation of biological parameters like total biomass that is represented by TGAP, uh, soil moisture and total water consumption is done to estimate the yield. The obtained data is updated on a weekly or 14 days basis to increase the accuracy. The key difference between the biophysical data modeling and the statistical data modeling is that the, the latter one uses a predefined machine learning technique like for example linear regression uh, random forest xg boost cat boost these are some examples of most commonly used machine learning techniques and the selected model is calibrated to the problem solving needs of the project that is in order to estimate the yield we we prefer we find out which is the most preferable machine learning techniques based on the amount of data that we have from the years, from the customer side on a diagram uh, leaf area index assimilation, the process would look like this. As you can see, the multi-temporal images of the set of the fields or the farmlands of the crops are collected uh, and modeled to observe different vegetation states with the help of leaf area index. It is uh, one of the most commonly used index to uh, estimate the amount of biomass present on the farmlands. As I mentioned earlier, all of our custom solutions, uh, for all of them, we require ground truth data or a set of input data. So it, it, it's the same for the yield prediction and the yield modeling process as well. So these are the some of these are some of the input data that we need we need to collect from your side in order to ensure that we are providing you a high accurate data, high accurate result. So starting with uh, an AOI sample file, as I mentioned earlier, like with uh, crop classification and field boundaries detection as well, we require an AOI file to analyze the quality of the field, like the, to analyze uh, what is the distribution of field in that particular region. The format could be in any of these vector file formats, like shapefile or a KML file or a GeoJSON file. Next, we require statistics related to the crop in that particular AOI. So those statistics are related to sowing date, uh, harvesting date, uh, details such as crop variety, the soil profile in that region, the weather pattern in that region for the current season and for at least three to five previous seasons. That is mandatory that we need at least uh, data coming, the crop statistics or the yield statistics from the previous minimum uh, three seasons from, from the historical data. The more, the better. Then soil profile analysis for the AOI, if it is available with you, it would be helpful. Otherwise, we can also collect it from our uh, sources. The, I would say the same for the weather data as well for the AOI. If you if you have any, if you're using any data, if you have a track record of weather data from a local weather station, or let's say a, any other different provider, you can share it with us for our reference so that we can cross check the data, validate the data that what we have for that particular region. Then uh, we also would like to understand, we also try to understand more details like general characteristics of the farms or the fields in that region, like information like what is a, uh, what should be, what is a distribution between the fields, what is the average size of the farms in that region, uh, where, what is the smallest size of the farms in that region, or let's say in terms of output, what is the spatial resolution that you require for the yield prediction? So whether you require, uh, uh, you want us to find out the yield estimate at, for for each field, or you want us to estimate the yield uh, yield value of the crop for at a regional level for a cluster of fields. And finally, what should the output look like? What should be the unit of measurement? Like it should, whether you want to see the yield value uh, get the yield value in, in kilograms or tons of grain per hectare and so on. We have also collected a case study uh, from a real project that we did for a Canadian insurance company. So let's have a look into this case study. Uh, we did this yield prediction project uh, in order to with the aim to provide with an aim to provide a uh, 
uh, predicted yield data for on every customer that our insurance company customer has uh, a client has to reduce their insurance risks so here we started with the collection of uh, field level information all the statistic the yield statistics uh, which are based on all those factors, the crop statistics, the soil profile analysis, and the weather data. And uh, we also managed to collect some publicly available data, like, for example, since the case study was done in this project, uh, this case study is from Canada, so we were also able to get some uh, data, like, like the ones coming from the sources, as you can see, the links provided to those sources. These are publicly available data related to soil profile, related to weather, and even the yield statistics from the previous seasons in Canada. By combining all this data, data sets, we were able to, uh, we were able to combine all these data sets and train our AI model to get some relevant outputs related to the yield value of certain some selected crops so we basically divided this project into three parts as i can say three tasks so the task one the number one task was to estimate the average yield of for six major crops on 20 farms and compare it with the actual yield report in uh, the statistical data the publicly available data uh, those publicly available data were collected from the administrative units in Canada. So we we would we, we were able to validate our calculated data with those uh, actual yield data. So the table on the top right corner shows you the model yield, the calculated yield, and the actual yield. So you can notice the level of deviation, and the the graph below shows the same information to understand the level of deviation in a better way, in a graphical like with the help of an image. The second task was to estimate the yield 14 days before the harvest of selected crops in order for us to assess the accuracy of the result. So the table on the right side, it shows the comparison of our calculated yield and the actual yield from the available statistics. We started le seeing less deviation from the yield, as you can see that the, the percentage deviation from the actual yield and between the actual yield and the calculated yield is less now. The third task and the final one was to provide our customer with the crop yield forecast to understand uh, crop rotation practices and reduce insurance risks. So that was the main goal of the project. So here in this table, you can look, uh, you can notice the predicted yields for the calculated yields for those selected crops from three uh, from different regions, and uh, you can see that the the values. The yield values are uh, represented in the form of uh, with the units of bushel per hectares. So to increase the further to increase the efficiency of the result, we used a technique called uh, jackknife resampling, which is used in it is one of the most commonly like one of the frequently used machine learning techniques to reduce the risk of uh, like overfitting data. Like if there is any excessive data available in the crop statistics or the input data that we collect from the customers. And to further get an, if there is an over like, like excessive data available, then the, to further um, get an average value of this, those data to make our uh, yield estimation process simpler and more efficient. From this project, we were able to find out uh, that the harvest period for the target crops in Canada for our customer, for, the, for our insurance sector customer, have a growth period that lasts till September. And we were also able to determine the accuracy of yield prediction or the yield modeling technique that we use. So we found out that two months before the harvest, the result had an accuracy of around 82%. The accuracy increased as the harvest was approaching and it reached a level of about 90% two weeks before the harvest. The quick, the key benefits of yield prediction, if we understand from this case study and also the techniques that we use, the kind of output that we were able to achieve, are that it helps in decision making for harvesting operations, uh, even to make uh, op decisions related to storing and even transporting the harvested output. It also gives us an indication of crop, uh, crop profitability 
And if we consider on a larger scale, an opportunity to manage food security by helping agrarian countries, the, the developing economies, which are more dependent on agriculture and food industry to prevent the effects of drought and implement sustainable agricultural practices. Now it's time for soil moisture analytics. Soil moisture is also uh, is an additional agro data that's helpful in forecasting the need for artificial irrigation, uh, especially if you have a regional farmland with different crop growing uh, seasons. There is a need to ensure that you know you you must ensure that you are able to the farmers or the agri business entities are able to get higher crop yield throughout the crop rotation practices. Also, soil moisture data helps in uh, helps financial services companies as well, like insurance companies, to track soil moisture, uh, to track the soil moisture readings, uh, to further make better decisions on the insurance payouts. Soil moisture data, if we consider, uh, it is known as the ratio between the volume of water uh, in the soil and the whole soil wo soil volume in percentage. Our custom algorithm uh, based uh, soil moisture calculation the, cal the the algorithm that we use to calculate soil moisture is provided also provided as an integrated feature on the crop monitoring platform which is one of our main products and also provided as an integrated feature on the white label platforms so for our platform users in us and canada we already have a soil moisture percentage in your platforms but for those who would like to expand their services in regions outside the us and canada it will be necessary to activate soil moisture analytics on your platform so let's try to understand like what kind of techniques we go through what kind of techniques are methods we carry out uh, to provide you a high accurate soil moisture data on this plat on the crop monitoring platform To estimate soil moisture content, uh, we use data from satellites which are equipped with radiometers. So mostly, those are mostly like SMAP from NASA and sometimes uh, AMSR satellites from the Japanese Space Agency if there is a need to access archived data before 2015. We are able to estimate uh, soil moisture at two levels, at surface level with a measurement depth of up to some from zero to seven centimeters and at root zone level with a measurement depth of up to 70 centimeters. This measure is taken over a grid size of two by 20, 250 by 250 meters per pixel uh, over a grid size like a land grid size of 250 by 250 meters. We are also able to achieve this accuracy with our downscaling techniques applied to the radio meter based data to bring the spatial resolution. So if you consider those satellites that I mentioned about SMAP and, uh, and AMSR, uh, these satellites provide us uh, radiometer data based over a spatial resolution of around like 25 by 25 kilometers and 36 by 36 kilometer. But with the use of our downscaling techniques, our own downscaling techniques, we are able to uh, bring the spatial resolution of the satellite data, the radiometer data, down to 250 by 250 meters. So in order to provide you better, like a uh, high accurate data, soil moisture data, we, we have the proprietary techniques to do that. As the radiometer is a, is a type of sensor which is used to detect uh, thermal radiation reflected from the land and to measure temperature without the need of contact. So this diagram perfectly explains how the thermal radiation measurement takes place. The thermal radiation of the land to be measured uh, creates a creates a radio frequency, like creates a radio frequency radiation, uh, which is actually measured by the radiometer's receiver. So the radiometer which is equipped in the satellites, SMAP and AMSR. Then further, we apply different techniques, different scientific techniques to ensure that the observations uh, are turned, uh, are tuned, uh, like are, are like uh, customized to achieve higher accuracy and elimination of atmospheric effects. So some of the techniques applied are time series analysis of radar observation, the radar data observations collected from radio meter sensors uh, for further for spatial disaggregation of radiometer brightness temperature. 
Then radiative tra transfer models uh, to simulate and validate surface soil moisture content with some level of uh, atmospheric correction of radar data. Then land parameter retrieval model to estimate the soil moisture from low frequency dual polarized microwave measurements. This diagram, this image shows, uh, explains the workflow of the techniques used. So as you can see that it shows us how the brightness temperature and the land surface temperature measurements are combined with uh, soil composition data to calculate the soil moisture over a region of interest, the country or a region where you want uh, the soil moisture data to be calculated at two different levels of root zone and surface level. Further, the calculated soil moisture data is validated by a comparison with actual soil moisture data, uh, which is like the actual soil moisture data is collected from the local weather stations for validation purposes. Different mathematical analysis are done to validate the soil moisture further at the different levels. As I mentioned, we are also provide we are providing the soil moisture data at root zone and surface level, so we are tracking those, validating those data with the help of mathematical analysis and uh, different validation techniques to provide high accurate data over our solutions, over our platform. Now, why is soil moisture data or the soil moisture content uh, necessary to understand or determine the crop health? So the main benefit of soil moisture analytics is that you don't have to physically be present at the farm to check the moisture level in soil. Sufficient water level is very important for crops development. Uh, lack of moisture or irrigation will can lead to poor yield, crop yield and less chances of survival of crops. Our soil moisture data is a real indicator of crop health since the data is also calibrated considering atmospheric influences from evaporation, water runoff and groundwater. On the other hand, excess, if you consider a case of having excessive uh, watering in the field and the farmlands, it can lead to uh, certain phenomena like root rotting and cutting off of oxygen supply, which results in dest destruction or destroying of the crops. Secondly, if we consider, uh, con uh, understand the, the practicality of having a soil moisture data uh, calculated with the help of satellite imagery analysis and the scientific techniques, uh, we can understand why you can rely on soil moisture analytics over weather station data. So our data, the soil moisture data that we calculate, it is mostly measured and not modeled. So in some regions, you may observe that the weather stations are separated by a distance of like more than 30 kilometers, 20 to 30 kilometers. Then if we think about it, then the farm data for the, uh, for the gaps between the stations if you think of, if you consider that, that it, it, you will understand that the data that you get from the weather stations, those are somehow modeled and not actually measured from the, you know, at a field scale. That is one advantage that we have with the soil moisture data calculated with, uh, with the help of satellite and the radiometer uh, data. Another aspect is that the soil moisture data that we offer, that we provide with the help of our like processing techniques, uh, that is scalable meaning that the data can be measured in any part of the world and it can be calculated also calculated for a large spatial area. Uh, with this, I finish uh, the information, the processes related to our custom solutions. But as I mentioned in our agenda, I would also like to tell you about our uh, your SAT project, which is our upcoming satellite constellation project. I thought about sharing information about this project as well, so that you can also realize that uh, what are the potential benefits of this sat uh, these satellites to our Earth observation solutions. So EOSAT constellation is, is set to be the first of its kind designed for the needs of agriculture industry. The constellation will include seven optical satellites to be launched into low Earth orbit by the year 2025. So at the bottom, you can see a time series uh, representation of the timeline of this project. We began with the system requirements and design review in 2020. The following year, we, we did the tests on flight and operations readiness. 
And in this year, in November, we are ready to launch the first satellite of this constellation. That will be EOSAT-1, followed by continuous launch of satellites until 2025 to reach full operations capability. After the first phase of the launch, we will ensure high vis revisit rate of satellites to cover all of the regions of the world and also a possibility to revisit uh, a targeted area in any part of the world, in any country for special agricultural projects. Uh, with no doubt, this will enable us to have a complete control over the satellite data production cycle with the use of our like processing capabilities, uh, our data processing capabilities, uh, and a skilled team of data scientists, space scientists, engineers, researchers with economic background, uh, in-house IT developers, uh, business developers. We are sure of upgrading our solutions and our custom solutions and also our main products, the off-the-shelf products with higher data quality and better than ever accurate business insights to our partners and customers. If I missed out on a point that we would be able, we would be enhancing the quality of data, the kind of insights that we are able to offer through our products and solutions, then this slide will give you an idea about what are the kind of uh, the upgrades or the high quality insights that we will be able to deliver uh, once we start uh, processing the data from our satellite constellation and delivering it over our products and solutions. So one of the key uh, characteristics of this year's sat constellation is the unique availability of multispectral bands that will enable us to work on special projects that may require uh, like insights like recommendations and you know recommendations and insights for better quality like though some examples are like efficient input management uh, disease and pest prediction like these are one of the anticipated future developments that we expect to have once we have the data coming from our satellite constellation uh, the bands, the multispectral bands will also allow us to enhance the quality, the output quality of our custom solutions uh, that we cover today, like yield modeling, yield forecasting, uh, crop classification, detection of arable land, uh, optimal crop rotation plan, and so on. So overall, we are looking at uh, improving the decision support system for our customers uh, using our platforms so that they will get precise recommendation in terms of like even other benefits like uh, other insights like input application, like recommendation on input application, irrigation, and uh, crop health analytics. Finally, I would like to, I would say the name of EOSAT is synonymous with sustainability. That is what we believe. Uh, the technology upgrade that will allow us to offer more complex solutions, like even like other solutions like uh, carbon emissions measurement from soil. And this can be achieved with profitability at the same time by tackling and reducing the risks caused by like certain in, uh, issues like carbon dioxide emissions from agricultural operations, uh, excessive use of chemicals, which leads to land degradation, uh, higher energy consumption for agricultural activities, and even issues such as food wastage and ongoing food crisis in the world. Or we can also say that in some region developed economies, it could be an upcoming uh, issue, food crisis, could be an upcoming issues in most of the countries. I would like to close this presentation uh, with this note that EOSAT, with EOSAT, we are aiming to uh, align our goals with United Nations framework for sustainable development goals in agriculture. Uh, those goals are related to climate action, uh, industry innovation, clean water and sanitation, responsible consumption and production, end hunger and life on land. The, the basic problems that we are we will, we will be solving with the EOSAT uh, constellation, with the, with the quality, the data quality that we will be delivering with the EOSAT uh, constellation, all those, uh, all those insights and the input uh, outputs that we will be able to get with EOSAT constellation will help us to answer or complement this United Nations six sustainable development goals. So with this slide, I come to an end to this presentation, to our event today. Uh, if you have any queries or business interest with us, then you can reach out to us at sales at us.com. 
uh, with your request in the subject line, or also you can also reach out to me directly at my email address, which is shown here in the slide, uh, bridgesh.total at esda.com. Now it's time for a Q&A session, the last segment of our event today. Uh, before we proceed with your questions, I will take a pause for a couple of minutes and uh, ask our moderators to post the most in interesting questions in the chat section. You can also post, uh, post your feedback about today's sessions if you have any recommendations or suggestions. Uh, apart from questions, you can also share those kind of feedback in the chat section. Can we have the list of questions posted in the chat section so that we can go through all together? some selected questions. I'm picking one question from the chat section from Haruna Alams. Hi, Haruna. Uh, so his question is, uh, are these tests paid for separately or part of the general package? Is a satellite able to monitor crops in arid or semi-arid regions? We do more of dry season farming here. So if you are referring to these tests or these solutions, custom solutions, uh, yes, we do have to consider the, the costs and the efforts separately because as you can see, the, the level of the kind of uh, input data that we require for these solutions, those could differ. So we have to consider all the process, all the data, you know, with a, you know, with a different consideration, with a different format and using different machine learning uh, techniques. So if you are interested to know more about the, the let's say, the commercial pack, uh, part on the, how the package is delivered to you, the solution package is delivered, uh, please write to me and I, I we can arrange for a call to discuss it further. OK, so we have the questions now. So first question is, a bulk of our farmers from northern Nigeria are livestock farmers. Uh, cattle rustling is at the center of banditry in Nigeria today. Is it possible to monitor livestock using satellite images now or in the future? Yes, it could be possible in the future, but right now our main focus or the prime focus is in monitoring uh, crops, uh, like crops, plants, or even trees, like tree plantation areas. Uh, but definitely, uh, it would be it would be considered in our product development roadmap, or let's say solutions development roadmap. We would be considering uh, services or solutions to monitor livestock as well in the future. Uh, the next question, how do you classify the mixed pixels of edge of the field when determining the crop boundary? Well, that's a bit, I would say, a technical question, uh, but I will try to, I, I'm not sure if I will be able to give you a 100% correct answer for this, but, but the, for field boundaries detection, we use a, a machine learning technique, which we simply call as edge detection technique. Uh, that technique enables us to also eliminate any like this kind of scenario. Like if we have a mixed pixels or let's say duplicate values or du duplicate field points, we are able to eliminate it uh, using some of the techniques, some of the data cleaning techniques that we have. Okay, the third question, uh, I think that was the one from Haruna. We already, I already answered it, but we can discuss more about it. Like if you're interested in connecting with us, then we can uh, set up a call and discuss further. Uh, 
Okay, we have more questions. Uh, what is the level of accuracy guaranteed with crop classifications? So the level of accuracy that we are able to achieve is uh, more than 90%, which is possi more, uh, possible because of the, the machine learning techniques that we use. And as I mentioned, it also depends on the quality of the ground data, the, the, the ground truth data that we collect from, from the region where we need to do the classification. But using our, like, uh, define like our uh, machine learning techniques, the algorithms that we have to, in order to uh, generate an output for crop classification, we are able to achieve an accuracy of more than 90%. If it is also, one more point to be added here, if the crop classification method is combined with field boundaries detection, then we can achieve even accu uh, accuracy of even up to 95%. Uh, Another question, what are the data sources used in crop yield forecasting? So the data sources, if you are referring to the satellite imagery, that is the main data uh, source that if you consider, uh, like if we consider the different processes that we use for estimating the yield, uh, the crop yield. Uh, well, most commonly we use uh, the data coming from Sentinel satellite, Sentinel-2, which is an optical satellite. Uh, in some rare cases, we also use uh, Sentinel-1 satellite, which provides us with radar-based data, especially in regions where we have like uh, long monsoon seasons in, in which it may not be possible for us to collect the data, the remote sensing data with the help of Sentinel-2 satellite. And again, one more factor that we consider is the average size of the fields, uh, the farmlands. Like if it is less than three hectares in certain regions, then we do consider the possibility of using higher resolution images, like which provide us uh, like a image, satellite imagery resolution of up to like, better than 10 by 10 meter per pixel. Uh, another question is, what is the minimum statistical data required to do yield forecast modeling. So the minimum statistical data that we require is, of course, from the current season, like we need to know what is the yield statistics or the crop statistic from the current season and the yield statistics from the previous three to five seasons. So minimum is like you, you will have to provide us with up to uh, statistical data, the crop statistical and the yield statistical data, which is the sowing data, the harvesting date from the previous seasons, from minimum three seasons, the pre, uh, three previous seasons. And we have plenty of questions today. So another question is, can you also develop custom vegetation index reports? Yes, we can do it. So as you notice in one of the custom solutions, which is which we recommend as a, a a combination solution with crop classification that is harvest status monitoring. If you notice there, we do a NDVI time series analysis. So what we are doing is basically uh, doing an analysis of NDVI index over a multiple, uh, like multi-temporal satellite images to find out what is the, the biomass estimate, or how is the growth of that particular crop. So we can also generate report for some custom vegetation indices, like there could be, uh, Depend, depending on your preference, like if you may like to have a custom vegetation index report for, let's say, LAI, leaf area index or green and DBI, for example, uh, we can do it. So if you are interested, you can reach out to us and we can discuss further about what kind of input data we might require from you and what will be the efforts required to generate an output, a report. Uh, one more question is, uh, can you add crop classification result to crop monitoring platform? Yes, you can. As I mentioned, crop classification output can also be delivered uh, in vector format, uh, in the form of a shape file or in the form of a, let's say, GeoJSON file. We can provide the output in that format. So most probably a shape file would be recommended uh, or shape file would be recommended uh, which can be further uploaded to our crop monitoring platform uh, platform and there you can visualize all the fields uh, classified uh, differentiated according to the type of crops thank you for your questions and also it shows that you are you were attentive during this session thank you so much i appreciate it
So I think that's it. Uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, if you want to personally talk to us regarding any business inquiries, any custom solutions requirement, uh, please you can contact us, uh, write the inquiries to us at sales at us.com or if you want to reach out to me directly, you also have my email address on the screen now. Uh, you can send us the inquiries with the subject in the subject line, what is the inquiry type? You will get the materials, I think, uh, Within 24 hours, uh, we'll process the this uh, recording of the webinar, and also, yeah, we can share the materials with you, Harola. We still have a few more minutes. If you have any questions, uh, you can post those questions in the chat section. So I think we can wrap up this session, this event today. So once again, thank you very much for being a part of this event today. And we hope to see you again in the, at the future webinars. We'll also have an upcoming webinar within this month itself, which will also be related to our custom solutions. It will be presented by one of our uh, one of our, one of my colleagues from the uh, technical department and a colleague from a business department. So. Uh, please uh, uh, please follow our pages, uh, like social media pages and also a LinkedIn page. You will be notified about that event. Thank you very much. I wish you all a nice day. Thank you.